Joe Gardner from Covers & Co. here. Uh, today, with spring just around the corner, we wanted to touch on some frequently asked questions about our full season cover crop. Uses on the farm. More and more farms are adapting dry hay cover crops into their operation. Um, really cost-effective way to feed cows for the winter. Nothing to be scared of as far as uh, the dry down time. If farms are used to, say, barley or oat green feed, dry down time's about the same. Um, so you expect seven to 10 days of dry down, you know, try and get um, as minimal rain as possible. Obviously, um, some strategies we've seen that have worked effectively is obviously crimper rolling, but also laying the swath as wide as possible. And also if there's an opportunity to rake or V rake a day or two before the hay is ready to bale, so speeds up uh, dry down time substantially. Still lots of full season cover crop being put up in the form of silage. So that's either in bale tubes as you see here or chopped. Some of the strategies that farms have the most success with is generally cutting it either with a disc bind, hay bind, crimping it, or with the swather as you see here in the video, uh, letting it dry down one to two days, uh, depending whether it's crimped or swathed, generally gets you to, to the desired result of you know 45 to 55% moisture we find is the sweet spot with silage. One of the advantages of using plant diversity uh, in a silage form is uh, the ability of plant diversity to hold on to moisture. So this was a dairy in Manitoba, took the full season cover crop early. Their goal was high protein, high digestibility. They had about 62% moisture and a very, very high protein feed. Going down the road, this was a beef operation. So they cut their full season a full three weeks later. They had the same moisture. And as you can see from the picture here, the legumes that grow lower in the canopy, indeterminate legumes, uh, stay vegetative, hold moisture and add protein to the feed. Grazing is becoming more popular. It's something we utilize on our farm. So the goal of this is, yes, of course, to feed uh, livestock in the summer, but return all that plant biomass back to the soil, stimulating the biology and really getting that soil functioning. So infiltrating water, you know, air, nitrogen, all the wonderful things that come with stimulated soil biology, getting that land ready uh, and productive for the following year uh, to go back in with a cash crop. The goal of cover crops is of course to maximize sunlight capture. So that means after uh, the first biomass is harvested, what plants are we gonna have or what can we expect as far as regrowth? So we've had a wide variety of conditions the last four or five years across Western Canada. So this is an example of 2019 was an extremely wet fall in our area. You can see there was a substantial amount of plant biomass that came back, probably as much as the original cut. Um, on a regular year, whatever regular means, uh, like last year, this had about a half an inch of rain uh, in September. The plant species that are gonna grow back generally are Italian ryegrass, burseem clover, hairy vetch, and purple top turnip. And this, uh, although probably on the drier side of the average uh, year, um, this is kind of what we generally expect uh, the regrowth to look like. So 2021 was dry just about universally across the prairies. This is just a neat story of a barley versus full season cover trial we did. Like I said, most years, the Italian ryegrass, hairy vetch, uh, clover, and turnip will be what regrows. But due to the extreme dry and hot and dry conditions in 2021, we saw virtually C4 grasses uh, make up 90% of the regrowth. So just uh, a good example of how uh, we don't know what conditions are going to be coming on that specific year, but it's plant diversity having the species that are going to thrive in those conditions no matter what. So what's in the blend and why? So with our full season cover crop, we're trying to mix uh, cool season species and warm season species at a rate of say 70% cereals, 25% legumes and 5% brassicas. Just the blueprint uh, mother nature has laid out for us and put, add it in as much diversity as we can using plant diversity as mother nature's insurance policy. So no matter the conditions, uh, we're seeing that we've got the right plant species that can propagate and produce plant biomass throughout the year, whether it's hot, cool, dry, no matter the condition. So sorghum is a, is a plant I think is very underutilized in Western Canada. Um, just the rapid amount of bi plant biomass that can be produced in such a short period of time 
It's the main reason why we say we wanted to lay seeding a bit, so keeping at the end of May, so the soil warms up uh, enough so the warm season plants can germinate and have a fair shot at sunlight versus its cool season quote unquote competitors. So an example of, of sorghum last year working great in some wet conditions in Manitoba and Saskatchewan where seeding was delayed, we just saw sorghum uh, capture a significant amount of both sunlight and produce a significant, significant amount of plant biomass, um, more than we'd seen in years past. So an amazing plant, uh, very water efficient, drought tolerant and uh, works well in the blend if we can get the soil temperature up to a rate where it's gonna germinate at the same time as our C3 grasses. The intermediate grasses that are in the blend, so the cool season grasses, so these are the plants that are gonna grow three to four feet high, our forage oats, forage barley, spring trit, and the warm season uh, intermediate grass would be German millet. So these are the plants that are gonna grow lower than the sorghum, but still get access to all the sunlight that uh, they need. Uh, because we've lowered the population on the sorghum, so uh, there's lots of opportunities for these plants to capture sunlight. We try and keep the population low enough, so still there will be some sunlight being able to go below these plants to feed uh, those indeterminate legumes. So the legumes in the blend, the cool season legumes that are there are forage peas, hairy vetch, and bursine clover. The warm season legume that we use is a non-GMO forage soybean, so that's in the event of a hot dry summer. We have a drought tolerant, uh, water efficient legume that's still going to be able to produce nitrogen for the blend, even in those extreme conditions. So all the thing all of these legumes have in common is they're either late flowering or indeterminate. So again, they just keep growing, they keep feeding that soil biology, but also holding on to moisture and increasing the protein of the feed sample. So what's generally going to regrow? We touched on um, the different years and the different extremes that we have seen throughout the, the prairies in the last three or four years. Generally, what's going to come back is Italian ryegrass, hairy vetch, purple top turnip, and bursine clover. Now, uh, in 2021, where it was dry, like I said, we had uh, different plants that regrew, but it's really about maximizing plant diversity building resiliency so no matter the conditions we can keep still have plants photosynthesizing and producing plant biomass that's going to feed the biology and feed our livestock building diversity in the blend so some species we get asked about lots is why is there buckwheat so buckwheat is a warm season brassica an excellent phospho phosphorus solubilizer sunflowers lots of good research out there about sunflowers uh, thriving in intercrop scenarios they grow taller uh, than virtually every other plant in the blend, so they have access to sunlight. We keep the population low so that it does not choke out or take away sunlight from other plants, and they root deeper uh, in the soil profile to access those minerals that other plants generally wouldn't get. Flax we use at low rates in every blend. So flax is most dependent plant we grow in Western Canada on mycorrhizal fungi. So this is just uh, to stimulate the mycorrhizal fungal hyphae network. The fungi is what is responsible for uh, the communication network and uh, mineral highway to transfer minerals between plant species to plant species. Uh, so having flax in there to, to stimulate that and build that hyphae network early, we think is a key to every single blend. Seeding and herbicide. So 95% of what's gonna make a successful cover crop is what happens at seeding time. So to maximize plant diversity, we say, you know, uh, in lots of places, the 20th of May, I think is the ideal time, but lots of crop went in well into June last year and where we were getting predictable rainfalls or uh, enough rainfall, we were seeing still substantial plant biomass growth and good plant diversity. Seeding depth at three quarters of an inch to an inch, and that soil temperature having at six to 10 degrees, so those warm season plant species have a chance to emerge with the, the C3 plants, the cool season plants, and capture sunlight evenly. So this is a really good example of what we're looking for, even emergence. So all plants are at similar stages of their life, have access to sunlight, and then uh, can propagate, stimulate soil biology from there. A good example, so lots of feedback we get early in the year is that the cover crop looks thin. So this is actually a very important part of uh, the blend's life cycle. So you can see in this example all the different leaf architectures. So what we want is each plant to have access to sunlight. 
If each plant has access to sunlight, the plant then can release uh, root exudates into the soil, stimulating that biology and creating a very healthy, diverse uh, biology in the soil. Healthy and diverse biology, stimulated biology, means that we can then grow plants rapidly. And you can see from this example here, the crop looks thin, and yet 10 days later we can see a, a plant canopy that is very diverse, that is filled in, and absolutely thriving with no mineral deficiencies, even though there was no fertilizer applied here. So do not broadcast. Uh, the key is even emergence, and we just don't uh, achieve that with broadcasting. So um, conditions have to be absolutely ideal for broadcasting to work. So we tell farms that are purchasing, please do everything in your power to um, get the seed three quarters of an inch to an inch, even emergence. If we get a crop that looks like this at this stage, there's a 95% uh, chance this crop is going to be absolutely fantastic. You can see how even that crop is, the different leaf ar architecture, uh, and now we can stimulate the biology and the biology is now responsible for growing those plants. We do recommend a pre-burn glyphosate pass if there are weeds present. Just be sure that there's no residual uh, in the herbicide mix as that will affect the growth of some of the uh, broadleaf plants in the blend. We have found over the past couple of years that a minimal disturbance drill can have a very positive effect on weed pressure in a cover crop. So keeping that soil covered, undisturbed, so not to trigger germination of weed seeds, I think is a uh, very good practice for keeping a cover crop field clean. Of course, don't put anywhere where there's glyphosate resistant weeds, such as kochia here. A good strategy if weeds do become a problem, so this is a low spot on my farm that flooded out last year, I think cut that plant biomass, that weed plant biomass early, don't contribute to the weed seed bank, and then if you're cutting early, um, generally we get better regrowth, so it's not a, a complete loss, but a good practice I think, uh, and something we do on our farm. Fertilizing cover crop blends. When we make a blend, we absolutely try and design the blend to minimize or eliminate fertilizer need, but there, we do have some farms that uh, do apply some fertilizer, have done some trials. We just recommend that if you are applying fertilizer, keep the nitrogen below 40 pounds an acre and the phosphorus below 10. But if you are uh, going to use fertilizer, we just recommend keep your rates low, so not to discourage the relationship between the plant and the biology. So 40 pounds of N, 10 pounds of FOSS, the farms that are using some fertilizer um, seem to have good results uh, with those rates. So every blend that we produce has multiple different legumes. So that is cool and warm season. So we need rhizobium bacteria to match. So we use Endure. Uh, inoculant from Verdesian, so it's a multi-species rhizobium inoculant, so we'll cover every legume uh, that is in the blend and comes in a convenient package as you can see from the video here. Uh, easy to uh, blend with the seed, uh, won't, don't, doesn't have bridging problems and gets very good uh, seed cover. To touch on feed analysis quickly, I think the most important uh, feed analyzer should be your cows. So we see this time and time again, uh, full season cover crop versus a mono crop. The cows just find it more palatable and are drawn to it and generally clean up the cover crop and the diverse uh, plant biomass well before they're gonna clean up uh, a, mono a mono crop. And due to the versatility of cover crops uh, and the different conditions that appear each year, a little tough to say to pin down exactly what the feed test is going to look like, but a general rule of thumb if you cut uh, the plants early, we're gonna have higher protein and less energy. So that can be anywhere from 14 to 18% protein. And if we cut later, so we're just looking to maximize the amount of winter feed uh, and we keep the cover crop growing for say uh, 70 to 90 days, it's going to be a lower prote protein feed source, higher energy and more tons. And you know, you can usually expect something between say 10 to 14% protein if it's left later. But again, this is really gonna depend on what kind of conditions, but also what kind of plants uh, fill your canopy and what plant biomass is actually being harvested. As with all cover crop blends, there is funding available through the off-calf program. So in Saskatchewan and Manitoba, that is the uh, Manitoba Saskatchewan Association of Watersheds. And in Alberta, the application is through RDAR organization. 
couple of page form. Usually they ask for a few pictures, but now is the time to be getting your applications in if you are considering a full season or already ordered seed. Uh, in Manitoba, Saskatchewan, it's $35 an acre, and in Alberta, it's 85% of your seed cost. So a great incentive to start adapting cover crops on your farm. So for any more information, please visit our website, coversandco.ca, uh, an excellent resource. You can find feed tests, soil tests, pictures, testimonials, uh, webinars, anything you need to make your experience with plant diversity easier, you'll find on our website. So hopefully uh, there was some valuable information in there today, and thank you very much for listening. Cheers.